for joining us on the SIP series on the STIR. Let's get right to it. Let me bring in my guest co-host, who's been one of the bright spots of this whole sheltering in place thing, Debbie Baldwin. Hello, Debbie. Hey, Trish. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, of course. So everyone knows probably already that Debbie's first novel, False Front, is now out. It was released earlier this month. And for those of us who finished it, we're waiting for more Debs. So I understand that you're already on it, actually. So tell us a little bit more about what you're working on right now. Um, well, False Front is the first novel in the series. Um, and the second book will be a different love story uh, involving two of the characters that readers met in the first novel. So all of the books are gonna have false in the title. Um, the first book, False Front, and the second book is going to be False Pretenses. Um, it's another um, suspense thriller. Uh, this one is surrounded by um, Wall Street hedge funds and art theft, and <laughs> it's very uh, fun to read as well so far. So um, I'll have more information about new releases and about how to download a free chapter of the first book on my website, which is debbiebaldwinbooks.com. Um, if you sign up for the rarely sent email newsletter, you can download <laughs> the free, the, free um, the first two chapters, the prologue in chapter one for free um, to see if it's, you know, something that interests you. And there's also a link to purchase information on Amazon and other online booksellers. So All right, yeah. So that couple that we have already fallen in love with, um, Nathan Bishop and... Emma Porter. And Emma Porter, Porter. So, you know, we're talking about endearing couples here and really, really um, a good fit for what we're tackling this week in terms of our must-see movie list. And we are talking about some of our favorite Hollywood on-screen couples, our twosomes of Tinseltown, what have you, on-screen duos. And Deb, I am so glad that it was you who made this list again because I would have gone crazy. I don't think I would have been able to condense it to our, our top 11 list here. Well, as you can see, it's a fairly recent list because if we start going back to Abbott and Costello and Martin and Lewis, you know, and, and, and um, you know, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, you get in your- Fred and Ginger. No way to yeah. it to 10. <laughs> so, I've stuck with sort of 90s and beyond, mostly 21st century couples, but um, you know, I had to put that restriction on it. Otherwise, the list would have 100 different couples on it. Exactly, and we're not just talking about romantic pairings, too. Uh, we're including buddy movies, BFFs in all genres, action, adventure, drama, so, and of course, comedy. So let us start with a duo who first started in action films together um, back in 1995, I think, with Die Hard with a Vengeance, and that is Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson. Yes, and Bruce Willis um, has a tradition in those Die Hard franchises of having a great sidekick. He has had one in all of the movies. Um, in Die Hard 3, it was Samuel L. Jackson who played Zeus, the uh, the unwitting uh, partner who gets dragged into this sort of cat and mouse chase around Manhattan. And that was sort of the beginning of a great pairing for them. They went on to then make the M. Night Shyamalan movie Unbreakable, which is a fantastic movie. I mean, I know everyone when they talk about M. Night Shyamalan talks about The Sixth Sense. Um, but Unbreakable, I think, is equally good. It's and making the rounds on cable right now, FYI. Yes, and that's, I think, largely due to the fact that they did another installment called Glass, which features the Samuel L. Jackson character um, as the uh, antagonist, as the villain, um, to Bruce Willis's sort of unconventional superhero, almost. And... Um, Again, those two are great, and I love watching them individually, and together it's even better. So that's and a great- And kudos movie. to Bruce Willis, who had an inkling that it would be Samuel L. Jackson who would be perfect for this role. And my goodness, was he right? And also, you know, when 
um, way back when, when Samuel L. was first asked about um, signing on to a Die Hard with a Vengeance. He even said, you know, my God, I've seen Die Hard, the original Die Hard, like 30 times. So it was definitely meant to be for these two. Yeah, they're, they're great. There's very little Samuel L. Jackson cannot do. So... <laughs> that, is true. that is true. That is true. So we're moving on to another um, buddy twosome, and this is a little bit more modern day, and we're talking about George Clooney and Brad Pitt. Now, clearly these two are friendly off screen. Um, they, their classic pairing is the Ocean's Eleven movies, you know, Ocean's Eleven, Twelve, and Thirteen, where those two really make the movie. I mean, there's a fantastic depth of talent in the cast um, of all three movies, um, you know, including Don Cheadle and Julia Roberts and it, Andy Garcia. It just is, you know, those are obviously really, yeah, really I mean, films. an A-list cast. Um, and they collaborated on another interesting film, Burn Before Reading, which is a jo Joel and Ethan Coen Brothers movie. Um, you know, it's funny on the credits, there's, um, they're listed as both appearing in Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which is the Sam Rockwell film, which if you're looking for just a quirky, offbeat, interesting, well-acted movie with a great cast, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, if you missed it when it was in theaters, is a very entertaining film. I would not describe it as a Clooney Pitt pairing. Um, Brad right. Pitt has basically a cameo, and George Clooney has a a slightly larger role, but um, um, again, it's a great film, although not a Pitt Clooney film. <laughs> no, not really, you know, and of course, I mean, that movie definitely, I think um, it went by quickly, but it's one of those underrated movies that you can really get into. But yeah. you know, we're talking about the classic Clooney Pitt pairing, and that is of course, Danny Ocean and Rusty Ryan <laughs> with, with the Ocean's 11, uh, 12, 13, series and um so did you know that the lead cast for this movie we're talking about that a-list cast they all had their own separate suites at the bellagio during filming must be nice you know but <laughs> yeah 7,000 square villas <laughs> <laughs> but um the director steven soderbergh wanted the cast to really have this vibe of being real friends. And so he, he kind of recommended that they hang out off screen as well. And apparently for the most part, the, the cast, you know, of youngish guys, just kind of circled around Carl Reiner during filming just to listen to his stories. And he, who wouldn't want to do that? That's great. Um, the, um, the great thing about Steven Soderbergh is he makes such incredible films. And then he takes on a movie like Ocean's Eleven, which in many ways is just this very sort of lighthearted heist movie, but he manages to bring so much depth in the, that, those character relationships because as the great director that he is, he sees that that's what makes that movie, is that, that those characters working in concert to you know, really pull off the heist, and it's it pays off. So oh, it pays off really, really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a delight to watch to watch the first movie, especially because it was something that's new. You're seeing this this great cast come together as one, like you say, and just you know, in just that short span of time, just the character character development. You see that in each one. Each one has like a quirk. Each one has a specialty. And Brad Pitt's yeah. you know character. Rusty eating all the time, which apparently Brad Pitt came up with himself thinking, you know, if they're a gang of people who are just so busy all the time on the go, he figured that the character of Rusty would be eating all the time. <laughs> well, there, so, was a, there were like a few years of films there where Brad Pitt, it was sort of his signature move. He always had like a sub sandwich. I mean, even in, um, um, uh, the new uh, film that just, he just oh, won the Oscar Once Upon a Time before. in Hollywood. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> just that image of him always with like a sandwich or like picking some, you know, fries out of a to-go thing is like sort of a, a, his signature move. You know what, Deb? I think we've figured him out. That's his <laughs> shtick. 
Well, hey, he's so adorable doing it, so no complaints yeah. here. <laughs> we really want Brad Pitt to anything, yeah. Exactly. All right, so moving down our list, this, we're talking about a modern day um, Hepburn and Tracy, and that is Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And my goodness, they've had four movies together, um, starting with a really off the beaten path movie, which is Joe versus the Volcano from 1990. Which, man, I mean, God, that movie, and that really is the movie that kind of ignited the two of them as that sort of classic Hollywood couple um, on film. And um, in the movie, Tom Hanks plays sort of an average Joe who gets misdiagnosed with a terminal illness. And at the suggestion of a benefactor, um, is flies to some remote, tribe to be their human sacrifice in a volcano. <laughs> okay. And in, in the meantime, he meets the daughter of this anonymous man who's suggesting this sacrifice. It's a strange movie, as you can tell, um, who is Meg Ryan, is um, the daughter and the pilot. And they <clears throat> obviously fall in love during the course of this La, you know, his last days, what he thinks are his last days on earth. And it's, you know, so it's a cute film and it's weird. And honestly, if you're sick of that kind of formulaic romantic comedy, this one's a little outside the box, so. Well, so I have to admit, I didn't get on the Hanks Ryan bandwagon until 1993 with Sleepless in Seattle. Was yeah. Joe versus the volcano, were the sparks already there? Was there already chemistry there? I would I say absolutely. It's that, you know, that's the kind of movie that you walk out of the theater and think I would watch those two do, you know, again, like they're great together. Um, they're so wholesome. You know, it's just a nice, they're just great together. Uh, Sleepless in Seattle, an interesting film because even though they are the romantic couple in the movie, they are not together on camera except for one very tiny scene um, when she's crossing the highway. Do you remember that? And she's trying yes. to see him and he sort of sees her. Other than that, they don't interact or meet in person in the film until the final moments. So it's, again, a very like atypical romantic comedy, but that movie works on every level. I mean, I was going to say for fans of that movie, it was definitely worth the wait for yeah. that, um, getting the two of them together at the end. And it is one of the American Film Institute's top romantic comedies actually coming in at number 10. And, and you can see why it's just yeah. so enduring after all these years. Definitely. Yeah. All right, so the next one, even more modern day, and I love these two together, and that's Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore were, you know, they had a, a, a box of time where they were definitely the sort of it couple for romantic comedies, starting with The Wedding Singer, which was a fantastic film. I mean, people who especially love that 80s era music and, um, you know, that whole vibe of that film is just funny. Just love and, it, yeah. <laughs> right, you just, I mean, want to put on your fingerless gloves and yeah. eat the popcorn. I it's mean, even funny. Adam Sandler's character's name, Robbie Hart, is so 80s that, you know. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And then they went on to make um, 50 First Dates, which is, again, an unconventional romantic comedy, but very charming. And, I'm, you know, Adam Sandler, I think, is, along for the ride with that Drew Barrymore is so charming and so endearing in a role that could easily, you know, she has a short term memory um, condition and every day she wakes up without a recollection of the day before that sort of Bill Murray Groundhog Day scenario, which right. if you don't have an absolutely lovable character in that role that audiences really want to watch, it would get fairly, tired really quickly. Yeah. So, yes. um, you know, applause. But Adam Sandler was those. perfect in it. You know, he was the guy who every day had to work to get Drew Barrymore's character to fall in love with him again. Yeah. And it was just so sweet the way it was presented. Um, just love it. Just love it. All right. So... We are moving on and we are making our way into the 90s now. And for the next set of twosome stab, 
we're actually talking about, in general, this group of actors called the frat pack. And so we're talking comedy here mainly. And the first twosome that we're going to talk about is Vince Vaughn and John Favreau. And they are, you know, they really, I would say, started the sort of frat pack movement with the movie Swingers, which was an independent film. It was very small. Most people hadn't, a lot of people haven't seen it, and most people hadn't heard of either one of them before that film, which is about two single guys living in Los Angeles. It's hilarious. It's very funny. It's very smart. Um, they are both incredibly charming. Um, Vince Vaughn, I feel like he coins a phrase in every film he makes um, from, you know, land the plane and couples retreat, which is now absolutely an everyday term. And in um, Swingers, it's money. Everybody's money. You're so um, money. Yes. And, yes. It's, and that's a very smart, very funny film. Um, and they, they are, again, then, then this group of other actors kind of cohesively joined them or they joined others to meld into, it's hard to like pick a twosome, you know, cause that you've got Owen Wilson lapping, overlapping with Luke Wilson, overlapping right. with Will Ferrell. So, and Ben Stiller. And, and ben so, yeah, it's Stiller, almost like a mix on. and match for this this group of guys. Yeah. Um, and so speaking of, of Owen Wilson, you've got Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson, who's probably one of our favorite duos among this frat pack of, of guys. And, you know, starting with Zoolander from 2001, those two together, oh, my gosh, I, they're funny. <laughs> I mean, the simple fact that those two guys who – everyone knows are not the most, they're not unattractive men, they're attractive men, but they are not m conventional models, you know, model looking guys to come up with this plot where they are the two biggest super male supermodels in the world. It's already funny. Like if they're just sitting around like having a beer at a bar and they say, you know, we should write a movie where we're like <laughs> two hottest supermodels in the world. Uh, and I'm sitting next to them, I'm like, I would go see that movie. And <laughs> All right. They, so pop quiz, how many male model looks were featured in Zoolander? I mean, I, I, I think he does mention to Christine Taylor how many looks he has, but I mean- He's I'm, got three. He's got the Magnum. He's got Magnum. He's got La Tigra. La Tigra. And of course, Blue Steel. Let me see if I, let me see if I can do it for you. Which one was that? That was the Tigra. Oh. Come on, Trish. <laughs> Blue Steel is totally different. Oh. That's Blue Steel. I see. Okay. Well, apparently Blue Steel was inspired by, you know, at the time Ben Stiller and Christine Taylor were married, and it, Christine Taylor had mentioned that it was a look that Ben Stiller made in front of the mirror when he combed his hair um dubbed blue steel so my god just comedic gold from start to finish everything and the cameos i mean <laughs> now i gotta go watch that again now <laughs> i know and of course um stiller and wilson would go on to make uh make meet the fockers in 2004 although not necessarily like top billing for both um it was actually stiller right. and de niro I mean, just those two as foils of each other with um, Owen Wilson as the um, romantic antagonist, uh, yeah. uh, I guess you would call him. And, and again, then also good pairing. Yes, and then also uh, Starsky and Hutch, which yeah. again was hilarious. <laughs> and then Zoolander too. Yeah, so they, are, they, they obviously work well together and their films, some are better than others, but they, those two are always great to watch together on screen. And so for our next pairing from the frat pack, this is a little strange, but um, Seth Rogen and James Franco um, also kind of belongs to that, just kind of on the outskirts of it. But they work well together, and they and have they collaborated made... in, gosh, six or seven movies seven all movies, together. Yeah. Um, and those movies, again, are hit and miss. Um, the interview, I think, was maybe the most famous because it came out, you know, it was their plan to interview Kim Jong-un, or I think it was Kim Jong-un they wanted to interview, and 
it was a big scandal and there were rumors of hacking going on at Sony. So if whether or not it was real or just a big publicity stunt, I, I think it helped the film get, a, get more notoriety than it probably would have. Their funniest film, I think, is Pineapple Express, which is a stoner comedy um, about a guy who wanders into a crime scene and the bad guys are after him and he accidentally leaves a part of a joint at the scene that he stumbles into and the bad guys are trying to find him based on the kind of marijuana in the <laughs> joint, which is called Pineapple Express. And James Franco plays the dealer and Seth Rogen plays the stoner and, you know, zany antics ensue. Made even funnier with Danny, McGr Danny McBride and Craig Robinson um, in the cast. And can you just imagine that cast, you know, off camera? <laughs> Honestly, I know. If you had to pick a cast of guys that you just wanted to kind of hang out with, that would definitely be on the list. Maybe we should do that list next. <laughs> All right, so kind of also on the fringes of this frat pack, um, these two, though, are, are complete standouts, and that's Will Ferrell and John C. Riley. These two are just I mean, a comedic couple. I would absolutely go so far as to say that they are, you know, the Abbott and Costello are the Laurel and Hardy of the 21st century um, from Talladega Nights, they uh, to Step Brothers, which is absolutely hilarious movie. Every interaction they have, the way they work together, the the fact that they're both individually funny, and that together that that inc amplifies the comedy. Surprisingly, is unusual. You know, you need sort of a good cooperative balance with actors, and I think those two are friends off off camera they had a big misfire uh with Holmes and Watson which was their Holmes sort and of Watson. Parody, um on Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson but you know <laughs> it, it, they they're not afraid to experiment so not I, at all well, and I, these two you know no matter how many times I've seen the Ballad of Ricky Bobby Talladega Nights and um Step Brothers I still cannot decide for myself which one is funnier. I know. It's, they're both great. I, I, my go-to would be Step Brothers, but I, I, you know, Talladega Nights is a fantastic film. Really funny. And so speaking of Step Brothers, you know that there's a little bit of a St. Louis connection to the movie. And that is St. Louis's own John Hamm actually auditioned for the role of Derek, which eventually went to Adam Scott. And, um, you know, I love John Hamm as much as the next person, but I just cannot imagine that car scene with Sweet Child of Mine without Adam Scott in it. I, I totally agree. <laughs> and I don't know if, you know, maybe John Hamm is just inherently too likable of a guy like Adam Scott has a bit more of an edge to him as an actor. He's a little easier to hate on camera. Um, and, you know, that no commentary on, on his, how he is as a human. I'm sure he's delightful. But John Hamm, even in uh, the, that, those early scenes of Bridesmaids, when he's Kristen Wiig's, you know, sort of ersatz lover and Honey. he's- yeah. yeah, and he's horrible, <laughs> but you still kind of like him anyway. <laughs> Oh, I know it's hard not to not to love him and yes I mean he he was a complete complete um jerk in that movie but yeah. you know <laughs> every scene in that movie with him you look forward to um yeah. so yeah so speaking of which um we're gonna move on to the ladies and um talk about a a comedic twosome and that is Tina Fey and Amy Poehler they I mean they're obviously best known for Saturday Night Live. Um, they have made some big screen films together that are very funny, but whenever I think of them, I absolutely think of Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I mean, that was one of those just priceless SNL moments that is, they, they were both flawless doing their impersonations. I mean, Tina Fey, 
when the real Sarah Palin came on the show, people weren't sure. <laughs> That's how oh, good she I know, was. yeah. Yeah, I, I remember those years when they were doing that also, you know, behind the desk on Weekend Update, those two together. I mean, just the chemistry with those two. And you can really tell that they are um, really good friends off screen just because they seem to just know each other in terms of timing, comedic timing. And, you know, you could see that too um, outside of the movies and outside of TV when you see them together at the Golden Globes yeah. and the SAG Awards, you know, emceeing together. Um, you really have that chemistry uh, between these two. Definitely. All right, so we're gonna move over to a little bit different genre um, from the comedy and just to, we're gonna throw in some drama here. And we are moving on to, you know what, Deb? I never realized that these two start in so many movies together already. And that is Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence who were first on screen with Silver Linings Playbook, of course, from 2012. Which is a fantastic film. Again, Robert De Niro playing the dad. <laughs> he um, is fantastic. Bradley Cooper, um, Jennifer Lawrence are the romantic opposites, play opposite each other and the romantic leads. And um, are, it's, it's such an interesting film. Um, a little, you know, offbeat for a romantic comedy, which again, is great. It's almost more of a romance, I would say. Um, and um, they, that's really the beginning of their collaboration and people sort of, I think, love them so much that they wanted to see them together more, which has that kind of old Hollywood, yes. you know, I love that when audiences respond to a couple like that, that they see that the chemistry is palpable and that they, you know, want to see it again and again. Yes, they sure do have that connection. And of course, you know, Silver Linings Playbook is probably the best known. And um, in 2013, they were together in American Hustle, which also starred Christian Bale and, help me here, Amy um, Adams? Adams. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, and they, again, that was not the a romantic, you know, that, that they were not a, rom a romantic couple in that film. That's a great film. Um, and it, they are more of an ensemble, part of an ensemble cast in that movie. But I mean, again, like just fantastic to watch together, watch them share the screen. Definitely. And those two movies, um, Silver Linings and American Hustle bookend, um, Serena from 2014, which I did not see. And then Joy, which I did That's see um, from 2015. Yeah, and Serena was a unfortunate film. It did not trans translate from novel to screen well. Um, it's a period piece um, that didn't get a big audience, and you know, just didn't didn't resonate well with viewers. And Joy again is a very good film, but again, they are not a romantic couple in it. But they are both you know, fantastic to watch in the film. So we'll have to like keep our fingers crossed for, you know, when people are back out going to movie theaters for another good Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence love story. I completely agree because, you know, Silver Linings in 2012 was the only film to be nominated that year for both lead acting performances. Of course, the best actress uh, went to Jennifer yeah, Lawrence at the Oscars and you had this famous, um, scene where she kind of falls <laughs> right, <laughs> on stage yeah, accepting right. her award. Um, but, you know, I mean, that movie really had everything in it. And imagine if, you know, it wasn't Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence's uh, Pat and Tiffany. Um, from what I understand, Mark Wahlberg was originally cast as Pat, originally cast. Um, and to go along with him, Anne Hathaway was originally cast as Tiffany. Um, I'm not sure if I really see that, and I'm not sure if the I, I can work. kind of see that, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, that Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence were sort of ideal, especially now that we're looking at, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking it, but um, I can see Mark Wahlberg in that role in particular, but um, Bradley Cooper, Oscar nominated, he didn't win, but he, you know, gave a great performance. Definitely, definitely. And so another one of those couples and one of our modern day couples, um, we've seen them more recently in 
the highly acclaimed La La Land from 2016, and that is Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. Absolutely. They are both just mesmerizing <laughs> on screen. And if anyone saw La La Land, you know how well you have to be paired to pull off a m movie musical as well as the two of them um, did in that film. I mean, they were so fantastic. And that movie is so unusual and, you know, interesting and almost won the Oscar for best film was announced, but was mistakenly almost, announced. Almost, yes. And, um, you know, that wasn't, of course, their first film. Their very first film together was Crazy Stupid Love, which is probably my favorite Gosling and um, Emma Stone movie. Mine Those too. Those two together, drama or comedy, it just works. And, and you can see that immediately. Yeah. And um, you know, Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling also sharing the screen for a lot of that film. You know, Steve Carell is the newly separated man and um, Ryan Gosling is the player who's going to coach him on how to re-enter the singles world and then unwittingly begins dating Steve Carell's daughter, uh, played by Emma Stone. So that movie is just a classic comedy. It's romantic, it's touching. It's Julianne Moore and Steve Carell's relationship as the estranged couple is fantastic. You, you, uh, your favorite, Kevin Bacon. As the it's the movie that marriage. gave us David Lynn Hagen. <laughs> David, David Lynn Hagen. <laughs> Play, played by Kevin Bacon. And Deb, you know, David Lynn Hagen is said 19 times throughout that movie and worth every single time, worth it every single time. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's a, becoming an iconic film, no question. <laughs> so they also had a movie called Gangster Squad from 2013, yeah. did not really get that much traction compared to the other two. Um, but again, it shows you that, you know, they really also work in something outside of crazy, stupid love, which was just crazy, stupid good. And they were the romantic couple in that film, and they were, you know, they have phenomenal chemistry in that movie as well. They were, it's a period piece about Los Angeles gangsters in the, I wanna say the 20s or 30s, if I'm remembering right. And um, it, that movie just fell a little flat. Um, the, the, scre the screenplay was widely criticized. Um, it just didn't do justice to the story. And if there was a saving grace from that movie, it was definitely Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. Um, you know, because really I could sit, I could watch them, you know, clip their toenails. They're so charming <laughs> and, and just beautiful, you know, really. <laughs> You know, back to La La Land, though, the very first time I saw that trailer, that little tease of them in a movie theater, you know, after having just loved them in Crazy Stupid Love, I mean, for the fans of these two, that trailer was so thrilling to watch. And they gave you just the little tease, like I think it was the two of them dancing amongst the stars. Yeah. And you didn't know what it was all about, and you just hear, you know, those those famous couple notes from the piano of that great, great score. And my gosh, I just remember the wait was just a long wait <laughs> for that movie to finally come out and yeah. to finally see what this is all about. Because all you do is catch, you know, catch a glimpse of them dancing and you have no idea what it was all about. I know, mm -hmm. that's great. <laughs> it's so, a movie, but, but really interesting and enjoyable. Oh my goodness, yeah. And those two, you know, I mean, not just the two of them on screen with that chemistry, um, but the dancing, you know, they did their own dancing, um, as you can probably tell. Singing, eh, you know, not too uh, hot about Ryan Gosling singing. <laughs> and you know what, that doesn't really bother me that much because a lot of it, you know, it's not, a, a he's not a singer. So in a film like that, it's expressing, you know, acting with a melody. And he's a great actor. So 
if he missed a note, it's sort of like Russell Crowe in Les Mis. I mean, he, people kind of bash that performance, but he was, he's a great actor and he sang what he felt. And if, you know, and Les Mis obviously is a little more of an opera and you needed someone with a little more training, but I, I'm not hard on actors for that really. Not complaining about Ryan Gosling being on screen at all. So. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had to be picky, it has to be the singing. But again, those yeah. two together is just movie magic all over the place. So there you go. That is our list of some of our most favorite Hollywood on-screen twosomes. And again, I'm so glad, Debbie, that the burden fell on you to choose our couples <laughs> because it would have been impossible for me and speaking of excellent pairings, for our sweet treat at the end of the show, we are going to give you a really classic pairing, and that is strawberries and dark chocolate, Debbie. Ooh, that sounds great. Well, it is great. It's so simple to make, too. I scored them on some really great, big, fresh strawberries from the grocery store. The strawberries right now are the size of apples. It's unbelievable. They're the size of your head. <laughs> But, you know, if you get lucky, you'll get a really good big berry pack. Because for the most part, when you get the big berries, they're lacking on flavor. Um, you know, the smaller berries are usually um, sweeter and the strawberry flavor is a bit more intense. But lately, I've been having great luck with these bigger berries, which is great. So we and are going- And it's a nice payoff because you're, you know, it's a lot of work to get that, you know, the stem off and then you get this little berry. But when you take the stem off those big strawberries, it's like five bites. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is too, um, you know, for these, it's so simple to make and really seriously a handful of ingredients, the fresh berries, butter, uh, dark chocolate chips, and a little bit of vanilla extract. And that's it. That's all you need. Perfect. Um, and it is just so sumptuous and it's so elegant and just really, really the perfect, perfect, perfect pairing to go with, um, you know, a nice romantic comedy, perhaps. And, and you know what the nice thing about it is, is it can be a very kind of elegant little treat for a, you know, at home date night, or it can be a fun like snack if you just want to dress up a, your strawberries. So exactly, gonna, exactly. Go, go do it right now. <laughs> all right. So thank you, Debbie, as always. And thank you all for watching. We will see you again next time.